Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for this uh, webinar, Pakistan's Economic Conundrum. Uh, as you are aware, this is a webinar, uh, so uh, your mics have been muted. But if you would like to talk to the panelists or discuss things amongst yourselves, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat feature. Uh, we will be taking your questions uh, later on in the program. And now I'd like to introduce Nassim Osman, a board member of Open New York, uh, to start the web a webinar. Nassim? Thank, thank you, Marco. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome everyone to Open New York's highly relevant and interesting um, webinar on Pakistan's economic conundrum, which is recurring, apparently. And I, firstly, let me introduce myself. My name is Noshin Osman. I serve on the board of Open New York and also as the treasurer of the organization. And for those of you who are not familiar with Open, this is a platform where entrepreneurs and corporate professionals of Pakistani origin come together to network, mentor, and support each other. I think we're up to 15 plus chapters now, um, including New York across the US, the UK, Pakistan, and the Middle East. I am highly, highly honored to introduce our two speakers tonight, Atif Mia and Asim Khwaja. Atif Mia, I think everyone knows both of these gentlemen, uh, one way or the other, or have heard of them. Atif Mia is a professor of economics at Princeton University and co-founder and director of CERP, which is the Center for Economic Research in Pakistan. Asim Khwaja is the director of the Center of International Development at Harvard University, the Sumitomo Foundation for Advanced Studies on International Development, professor of international finance and development at the Harvard Kennedy School, and also a visiting professor of uh, business administration at the Harvard Business School. He is also a co-founder of the Center for Economic Research in Pakistan, or CERP. Uh, Mr. Khwaja has been published in leading economic journals, uh, including The Economist and The New York Times, and he's appeared on Al Jazeera, BBC, and CNN. Finally, I would like to uh, say a few words about Tariq Khan, who is the current president of Open New York. Tariq has almost 30 years of experience um, in the corporate world, um, and his most senior corporate leadership role was as senior vice president and head of marketing market development at ING. In 2010, Tariq founded the Global Diversity uh, Marketing um, Company in New York, which is a leading management consulting firm that has helped global fortune companies. Besides Open New York, Tariq also serves on the board of several nonprofit organizations. And um, he also is an adjunct professor of marketing and leadership since 2015 at the NYU Graduate School. And if that's not enough, Tariq is a published author of the book, Leadership in Changing Times. Tariq, I would like to hand over the discussion to you so you may start the fireside chat and moderate. Thank you, Noshin. I truly appreciate the kind introduction for everyone. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, my special thanks goes to um, open New York board members and uh, our support team, Marco, Brian, and everyone else who have supported us putting this webinar together. Um, my special thanks to Amir Shuja and Asad Nakvi, who really helped us cultivate um, you know, these wonderful panelists for today's webinar. I will try to waste as little time as possible um, in giving you the background and more importantly, start the discussion. Uh, but a couple of housekeeping items. Um, this is going to be a highly participated webinar. We are recording this webinar, so we'll be sharing it later on. I request all of the participants to kindly hold your questions till around uh, 6.45 p.m. Uh, we wanna make sure that we get to as many questions as possible and we don't wanna get your questions lost. Uh, so please, uh, 6.45 will give you a cue and you can start putting your questions. And uh, we would announce that question with your name. If you don't want your name to be announced, just mention that in the question as well. So uh, we are very fortunate to have two of the most eminent um, economists with us today. And um, who else can understand Pakistan economies than these two? Um, very warm welcome to Atif Mia and Asim Khwaja. Thank you so much for joining. 
I would like to have our conversation in three buckets today. Uh, the first one is, uh, what is the current economic situation in Pakistan? The second would be, how did we get in this situation? Obviously, this is not something that happened in six months or three years or four years. Uh, this is over 70 years of uh, challenges that we have faced. And then the most important third section would be about how do we get out of this if there is any hope. Uh, in the beginning of the webinar, uh, when people started posting questions, the picture was very bleak. Um, but I hope after talking to you, there is some hope um, and we, we get more confident in that. So now I would start with you, Atif. Um, please walk us through that journey that, you know, what is the, the current situation in Pakistan? And what are the, some of the biggest challenges and opportunities that you see? Well, I'll start with the current and the immediate. Uh, the current situation in Pakistan is uh, extremely distressing. Um, I don't think I've seen uh, the, the economy this bad, at least in my uh, memory. Uh, there are two things which are sort of uh, reinforcing each other. Uh, the first one is, and they're obviously connected, the first one is rising inflation. And the second one is a contracting economy and contracting at least in the sense that growth is slowing down um, remarkably. Why are the two connected? Well, because if you have an economy which is running on serious deficits, uh, just to give you a sense of how serious the deficits are, the federal government, whatever revenues it collects, it has to pay a portion of it to the provinces. Uh, after doing that, the net revenue that is left with the federal government, um, it is not even sufficient anymore to pay just the interest on the outstanding debt obligations. So before, um, it doesn't have any rupees left to pay pensions, let alone pay the first PN or the first soldier um, out of the revenue that it collects. So it has to try and borrow more money through deficit financing, which is uh, in a way you can think of that as printing money in the current context. So when you have a macro situation where the government does not have real resources and is using fiat money essentially to run itself, um, and everybody has a sense of the ship is sinking. What you're seeing along with it is a flight of capital, both physical and human. Obviously, nobody wants to invest in that kind of a situation. And it is for this reason that, again, you have this combined force of a contracting economy and an inflationary economy. And so the combination, which typically we refer to as stag stagflation, that is a dynamic that has set in. And it is this particular dynamic that if you notice over the last 20 years, this is what is new and different. Uh, Pakistan has always not done as well as its peers. For example, growth has been consistently low and has had a pattern which is uh, skewed towards consumption as opposed to investment, skewed towards uh, the non-productive sectors as opposed to the productive exportable sectors. So that has always been true as an underlying kind of structural disease, if you will. Uh, but the economy, in my view, has moved beyond a tipping point in recent times. And I've just given you uh, a couple of the dynamics that I think are important. Um, and the last thing I'll say before I leave, uh, give the floor to Asim is, that the other thing that worries me a lot is given this situation is the response of the system, so to speak. Um, and by system, I mean those in and around power who are supposed to be at the helm of affairs. If you look at the response of the system, that is equally troubling. And it's the and when you put these two things together, the state of the economy and the response of the system, I think there is reason to be uh, quite worried. What do, what, do, what do I mean by response of the system? Let me just give you a, a couple of examples and then I'll end on that. Or if you first look at the current government in power, they have ruled over Pakistan for you know, multiple terms and years. And yet when they are faced with this kind of a, a situation, 
uh, there is first infighting inside the government where they one half of the government tries to remove the finance minister who is first put into that position by the party itself. And then they put in place someone who frankly has no idea what needs to be done and takes a bunch of decisions that makes a bad situation even worse. And it's not, you know, we have seen this movie play out before. The only difference is this time the situation was even worse. And so the, 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 uh, the, the, the consequences have been uh, uh, worse as well. Uh, similarly, if you look at the previous government, when it was in power, as the situation was turning bad, it was more concerned about short-term gains, and they did things like give subsidies to uh, for for fuel at a time when the country had was running very large current account deficits and was running out of reserves on a monthly basis. Um, and then the third big power player is the military, of course. And now everything has come out in the open in terms of what the generals were up to what kind of games they were playing um, as the, the, the previous government and the current uh, part, uh, party in power when they were you know, out trying to outmaneuver each other. Uh, the army was actively involved in pol politics by their own admission. Um, and so I think I'll just close on this. The, it's not just that the situation is bad. I think if you look at the response of the governing authorities of various sorts. It's that combination that at least makes me very depressive. And I think we really need, there's a big question of collective action and where that will come from to, to, to turn the country around. And I'll just stop on that note. No, thank you. Thank you, Atif. Um, awesome. This is a pretty bleak picture, um, but he's speaking the reality and, and he touched upon the provincial distribution of the, the funds inflation and deficit financing. Uh, what's your take on that, um, if any different? So Atif and I were, were joking in the, before this and saying, you know, we should play good cop, bad cop. And so I have been given the role of good cop. Uh, um, but let me start by first acknowledging what Atif said. I think if you look at the macro picture, it's indeed as bleak as Atif is saying. I think it's important to recognize that, not to, for us to get depressed, even though the tendency for us is exactly to feel, I think the way Atif is feeling, the way honestly every Pakistani is feeling, no matter where you're coming from. Uh, uh, but, but I think it's it's to make you realize that this is, a, this is a time where your actions can be very pivotal. What you choose to do, what decisions to make can have huge, you know, often in a lot of economies, things are kind of working and, you know, no one set of individuals can be really pivotal. I think Atif is giving you some really powerful examples where people are pivotal at a time of macro crisis and are pivotal in a negative way. You know, I was, I was just thinking, I was talking to a bunch of friends the other day and saying, I, I just wanted to be a fly in that wall in that meeting where a bunch of people are discussing Pakistan's economy. I don't know where that meeting happened. I don't know who is in that meeting, but someone raised their hand and said, oh, I have a brilliant idea. You know, we, our macro economy is struggling. Why don't we go and arrest one of the most popular political figures we've had? And I'm sure that will help. You know, I just need to understand in what system can that conversation have occurred? In what system did that person raise a hand? And in what system does someone agree to them and say, oh, great idea, let's go ahead and do that. So there is a sense in which what Atif is saying is correct. That said, I think if you want to take a positive spin on Pakistan, which I also think we, we desperately do, because if you lose all hope that it's very difficult to get agency and coordination of the type that Atif is, is saying we need to, and I think a lot of people are agreeing, and I am agreeing with that as well, is there are two ways to think of Pakistan in a slightly more positive spin. One is, you know, not in the one year or two year or five year horizon, but actually in the 40 or 50 year horizon. And there, you know, there are indicators, you know, Atif and I have both talked about this, some indicators have been flatlined even in that time period, like exports to GDP, things like that. But there are other indicators which, uh, to me, are indicative of Pakistan's people. So I'm very positive about Pakistan's people. And when I say people, I don't mean the individuals Atif is referring to. I mean the individuals who should hopefully vote them out and never elect them again and never support them again, um, the average citizen. And when you look at that, when you look at indicators like maternal mortality, child uh, or um, or um, you know, child literacy rates, or even female labor force participation, which isn't great in Pakistan, but if you look at trends, 
Um, you know, we often, for instance, cite Bangladesh as a great example of female labor force participation, and it is. But if you look at the, the increase in percentage points, the level of Pakistan is smaller than Bangladesh. But if you look at the trends over the last 30 years, our trends are the same as Bangladesh's trends, very steep, very positive. Um, and so there is a sense, and when you both draw the window a bit wider, when you look at more human indicators, uh, when you look at the average person, uh, you start seeing a different kind of picture. It still begs the question Atif is raising, because when you look at, you know, I spend a lot of my time in my research looking at that micro picture, whether it be education or finance, but at kind of the average Pakistani level, uh, what you see is a vibrancy, what you see is an energy, what you see is a resilience, despite the, the, the nastiness of the macro situation. And that macro situation could be man-made, like the, the current financial crisis we've induced on ourselves. It could be naturally given, like the floods uh, and other disasters we've had. And in each one of these, what you see is the individual response, not the system response that Atif is saying, but the individual response is actually pretty impressive, uh, pretty positive. That's one, also one of the reasons why we've created, um, you know, when the system doesn't deliver, you start creating non-formal mechanisms, uh, non-state mechanisms to address. So think of the basic necessities of life, you know, um, safe housing, uh, good quality education, good quality health care. In each of these instances, what you see in Pakistan is when the state isn't able to deliver, there is an entrepreneurial drive, or whether it be the private sector or the nonprofit sector, which is coming in. Um, we may not like it. We may still sort of step back a bit and say, well, why is this happening? But honestly, I think of these three sectors as complementary. You know, um, I wish the state were to deliver in the way that Atif is saying that I would like, that a lot of us would like. But I also acknowledge the private sector, at least in domestic services, is beginning to deliver. It's still not delivering in the export world. And there are lots of reasons we can come to for why that's happening. I think we're not competitive globally, but I think we're beginning to deliver decent quality services domestically. Um, uh, I also think of the nonprofit sector as a fascinating sector because I think of the nonprofit sector as a sector. I think often nonprofit sectors don't quite understand their own true value. They think of their value as a scale play, supplementing the state's play. I think of nonprofit sectors as innovators, uh, showing what could be possible. It may not be financially viable, it may not be politically or administratively viable, but they deliver it. Right? And then that creates the what I would call the innovative frontier of any economy. And then it's up to the private sector or the public sector to see if they can take that to scale. For the private sector, it will be have to be commercially viable. For the public sector, it has to be politically viable. But there is a role for all these sectors. And you do these, these three sectors playing a big role. Now, we're not, uh, when you think of the nonprofit sector, we're not like Bangladesh. Bangladesh, um, post-71, had tremendous progress being made. But if you, if you talk to Bangladeshi economists and Bangladeshi experts, the progress comes not from the state sector, it actually comes from the non-profit sector. When you think of Brak, Prashika, or Grameen, these are the three largest NGOs in Bangladesh. In fact, some of the three largest NGOs in the world, you see a lot of the innovation you see in Bangladesh, women in the workforce, empowerment, better healthcare, better human capital acquisition, comes because of a push of the nonprofit sector in the wake of a disaster, by the way. If you, if you look at Bangladesh, it's fascinating. When you trace the genesis of a lot of these efforts, it comes from very dark places. It comes from the cyclones in the 70s. It comes from the separation, a very bloody separation of Pakistan and Bangladesh in the 70s. So it comes from a deep sense of loss and collapse. And, and if I were to put a bit of a silver lining in what Atif said, you know, maybe this is the time for us to realize that you know, things won't work the way they used to. This feels different to us. It's not different in the sense that Atif is right. This has been years in the making, but it's now made in a bad way. It's now, you know, you know, I'll turn back to Atif in the discussion on this, but I wouldn't be surprised if Pakistan, I mean, Atif is right. Technically, Pakistan is in default. Right? We, can't, we can't make the payments. And so if this was like a household having borrowed money from a bank, the household would be declaring bankruptcy right now. And so there's a question whether will Pakistan declare bankruptcy in the way Sri Lanka did and what the consequences of that would be. But whatever the situation is, to kind of put it forward and say, it's okay, we can wait, it's fine, we'll roll the loan over, we'll go to China, we'll go to the Saudis, we'll go to the IMF, 
beg and cajole. I hope one message that for those of you who are reading what Atif is writing and frankly what others are saying, I hope that one message is very clear that that's not gonna, that's not a viable option anymore. And so for me, I'm hoping that this is the moment where, you know, the, the, the equivalent of the 70s crisis for Bangladesh comes to us. We take advantage of the fact that our people have that momentum, have that energy, have that drive. And then all the macro and systems has to do is kind of get out of the way somewhat, right? Just let it happen. Uh, right now, they're getting in the way in, in many ways. And again, I don't want to dismiss what the average person is going through. There's massive inflation. The cost of living is going off the roof. This is not going to be an easy time. The next five years of Pakistan are not going to be easy. None of us are saying that. But I don't think what I'm saying is they're not solvable. Of course they're solvable, right? These aren't situations where I'm not seeing that kind of situation, even if the break happens, where we as a people can't come together, at least on the individual level, and kind of push this through. So let me stop over here, but I'm happy to get into the discussion. No, so, I, yeah. I think that that was a great input and, and just touching on the Bangladesh, we have a great example right in our neighborhood, uh, not too far away from us, uh, which how they have repositioned themselves as a manufacturing economy. Um, before I go to the next session, I wanted to get a very quick um, feedback on in two areas, which really impact a common Pakistanis. Uh, one is obviously, uh, we all know that this uh, un uni unique or unprecedented stress that we have due to foreign debt uh, of not being able to make the payments, um, but how about this depreciating um, uh, currency that we have, which is really skyrocketed? Um, how big of a problem did you see that and, and how quickly you see that being resolved? And if we have ever any, any chance of going back to where we were uh, only a year ago? Well, the depreciating currency is a consequence of deliberate choices that have been made over the, uh, over the last many years, and I've been talking about many of those in some of my previous uh, conversations. Um, just to give you some examples, um, Pakistan very, and, and in fact, you can just compare Pakistan to India and ask yourself the following question, how much dollar denominated sovereign debt does India have relative to Pakistan? And what you'll find is it's negligible. They just don't borrow in dollars, the government. They are the same people as us. What is that's what I'm saying. The governance is we have to realize we how badly we have messed things up. Why don't they borrow in dollars? Well, because it is a liability in a foreign currency that you can only pay back if by using that money you generate exporting capacity. What we have done instead is that we have increasingly, whenever a government, uh, even now, whether it's not just about going to the IMF, but even if you look at CPEC, I was very early on saying CPEC is not making sense the way you have structured it because you're borrowing in dollars to invest in areas which are primarily going to be servicing domestic non-tradable sectors. The math is not going to add up and pretty soon you are going to have too many liabilities and an inability to pay it off. But then on top of that, you institute a, a, a set of policies such as this over Em emphasis by giving subsidies and all that to the real estate sector that creates what is sometimes referred to as a Dutch disease kind of a situation where you become extremely uncompetitive because it's too expensive even to buy a piece of land uh, to, uh, to, 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 to run a competitive firm in Pakistan. Uh, then on top of that, you have this major, major issue. I want to come back to something Asim said, which I totally agree. By the way, let me just say on an we are, we are both on the same page on this. Um, I might sound more negative, but my actually my reason for sounding very negative is to try to wake people up. That's the main reason I'm always saying, please, try to understand. I don't want people to fool themselves mm -hmm. things are not going to change. There is a system, a structure that has been put in place that has led us to this situation. It is because of that structure that systematically Pakistan has not kept pace with the rest of the world. And currently the situation is so extreme that now we have hit that non-linearity that things are spiraling out of control faster than they have ever done. And to change that, we need to understand that we do have agency to change things, but it, it will require very serious collective actions of sort that we have often not even talked about. And I also agree with Asim absolutely that 
in every situation where we have seen growth, whether it's Bangladesh, India, China, Korea, it's been private sector that has led the way. It has always been the case and it will, it is going to be the case for Pakistan as well. And of course, private sector in Pakistan has the potential to be vibrant in the way that we want it to be. But the most important, this is where governance comes in. The most important thing for the private sector is that the environment in which the private sector works is provided by the government. The government's job is to coordinate across the various private sectors to provide the basic fixed costs, if you will, and the environment that is needed. So we were talking about compare it to Bangladesh. Let me just give you one very simple reason why Pakistan has not done what has happened in Bangladesh. Think of the state of tolerance and violence in Bangladesh versus Pakistan. Think about the attitude and treatment towards women, especially women in the workforce in Bangladesh versus Pakistan. This is a structural issue. The Pakistani state, starting with the army, but then from the previous Rirasti Medina to the current government in power, they have all tried to create an environment of intolerance, which has created this sort of social structure that is not conducive for a vibrant private sector. Even countries like Saudi Arabia are realizing that you cannot have a hard line religious approach and then diversify into service sectors and so on. Even they have understood it. We don't have the luxury of oil that they have, and we still have not understood it. And this is what I'm talking about, that until and unless you take these serious questions on, things are not going to change on their own. I mean, I'll add just one thing to what Atif said. I agree with Atif. Um, I mean, the tolerance thing is a tricky question, but, uh, um, but, but, but I understand where he's coming from or what he's saying. I think, you know, as, as a nation, we've, at a very high level, what we've done is we've, we have a very funny view with the rest of the world, which is as consumers, we are global. We consume the, the products of the world. Um, yet as producers, we are very hyper-local. We don't sell to the world, uh, right? And what Atif is saying is fundamentally that mindset. India did the opposite, right? India for a long time was basically very inward looking. Our sense of openness was basically, okay, huh, Pakistan is a very open country. It's great, we're so open. But what that openness led to was not us being competitive in the world. It led to us importing, not just, uh, Atif is saying we imported money, basically. We borrowed in dollars, which is the stupidest thing to have done at a time when you can't handle your own currency. And now we're in this situation. But it comes from this mindset of really thinking of the world as a place you have consumption, but not as a way you can be competitive in. And I think that mindset needs to shift. So a question for both of you. Uh, and I think, um, Asim, you raised a very good point. I mean, look at our country and our real estate. Uh, we have such a great resource in um, agriculture. Uh, and we have not fully leveraged as a country, right? And once we used to be a manufacturing economy, uh, that has completely gone away. And for a country that has over 65% of the population under 30, um, this is going to create a lot of problems. We should be creating jobs. So quickly before we dive into the second half, any uh, feedback from you or any input on that part? Why don't we do this at the end? Because otherwise we'll just run out of time because okay. that's part of the solution. So um, I think we can so, come to that. Yeah, so uh, quickly, and, and I want to be sensitive of the time, um, uh, top three reasons that we are in this situation. Atif, I'll start with you first. <laughs> That will give us more time to come up with his three It's being unfair on Bichara Atif. Yeah, yeah. I'll just copy what he does and react to it. He's Maybe. closer yeah. to me. He's in Princeton, so he's closer to me. Atif, um, I'll... Yeah. Governments is one of them, definitely. <laughs> Look, I'll say something very straightforward. Uh, open has obviously uh, entrepreneurs. And I think every entrepreneur knows that if you want to run a company well, if you want to create a business, one of the most important attributes of a successful business is to have competent leadership and a competent team at the top. It's just a very, I mean, it's not like 
it's not rocket science on that level. And what Pakistan in a way has forgotten is just the importance of some basic level of competence and the importance of talent at the very top to run uh, important areas. And if you look at, I mean, for so long, if you look at the appointment of people at the top, we were just talking, I was just giving you the example of the finance minister. I, I feel bad to pick on him every time, but this is, this is a serious matter. You cannot run a country of 240 million like that. We just asked why we haven't grown in manufacturing and agriculture. Well, the fact of the matter is that Pakistan for multiple years, because of the same attitude that we are seeing right now, has tried to maintain an appreciated real exchange rate through borrowing in dollars that you then are unable to pay. In this kind of an environment, how do you expect a manufacturing uh, company to be competitive internationally or in expected terms to feel secure that if I invest X million dollars today, they will not change the policy on me that they will start implicitly taxing me by keeping uh, an appreciated real exchange rate. So I think I'll, if I, I'll, 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 I don't think it's like one needs to go into three reasons. I think I'll, I'll just give one, which I have said more broadly as saying, look, the decision-making process is broken. The nervous system is not there. And that basically has to start by putting a system of simple governance at the top where you have some competence to make decisions which are really important for the country. I can give you another example in the energy sector. Look at the way we have run energy, where it has been deliberately designed in a way, when we talk about circular debt, you know what that is? It's a deliberate design energy policy, which is designed to run in loss because there is no way the people of Pakistan can afford to pay the true cost, which is in dollar terms. And so, uh, you know, and, and, and when you're making such major decisions in ways which are just sort of baffles one's mind, because, you know, you just have to run a simple Excel sheet to understand these basic points. This is not rocket science. So no. it's not an enigma. We are where we are. If you think about the way, and I'll just come back to this point because I think it's really important. Think of what we have fed our young minds. The poison we have fed through the educational system. I mean, I can give you examples of how the lawyers are acting in Pakistan right now. And we have deliberately done it through an education, quote unquote, education policy. So one cannot continue to run things like that and then expect that somebody will come and give a sort of an out of the box answer to say, well, you can continue to do all of that, but here is a solution and you can be the next query. It's not going to happen like that. You have to go back to the basics and in a way, start from scratch because that's how bad the situation is right now, in my opinion. No, I think that's very good. But the only uh, glimmer of hope that I get from this, Atif, is that uh, it's leadership and governance that's fixable. So we are not in a chronic uh, situation which is not repairable. Um, Asim, what's your take on that? Um, in, in well, I'm not sure I agree with either your statement or Atif's statement. Uh, let me just uh, explain. So, you know, like when you study political economy, leaders are endogenous. They're not God-given who just land and decide to do good things. You select your leaders. Um, and so while I'd agree with Atif that when you look at the leadership held in Pakistan- Let me just correct one thing because I, I agree with what Asim is saying. So let me just clarify one thing. I was not talking about what I was actually trying to say was that whoever comes as a leader, one of their most important response, I was giving an attribute of how you judge a leader. Yeah. The way you judge a leader is it's who they delegate responsibility to. And this is why I was giving the finance minister because the finance minister is not a leader. He is chosen and delegated. He is appointed by whoever the leader is. That's what I'm trying to say that the whoever the leader is, in fact, it doesn't, you know, the leader, that's the only attribute I need in a leader. The leader does not need to be smart or a messiah or whatever, but he or she needs to appoint and delegate authority to competent people. That's the only point I was trying to make. Yeah, I agree. But Atif, the, 
The issue right now is when you endogenize all of this process, the question becomes, uh, and this will come to this in the solutions, uh, when you take even a set of 500, like imagine one could say, look, could I replace 100 people in Pakistan in certain key positions? Suppose we could wave a magic wand and do that and get the right competent people. I think it'll absolutely make an immediate difference, but it's not gonna make a structural difference uh, because the process of how we choose who represents us, um, you know, I, I think we do suffer. Uh, I think we suffer from some misconceptions and I'm not saying these misconceptions as they're misconceptions in terms of we were so totally stupid to do this. Um, I think they're misconceptions which come from an, a view of the world which could have worked in some states of the world, but didn't. Uh, and let me, let me give you first one very specific example of that in education, because it's really easy to talk about these in, in abstract, but you should kind of bring data and, and actual substance to these conversations. Take education. In education in Pakistan, so I've been doing work with Tahir and Rabi and Jishnu Das for the last two decades. And we look at public schools and private schools. This is the same Pakistan, the same people, the same leaders, the same political economy, everything is the same. The private sector outperforms the public sector with much less resources, significant. Not like the private sector is about a year and a half to two years ahead in educational quality. So you ask, why is this happening? Why is it that the public sector is not producing education of the quality that the private sector is doing? When the public sector has more money, has better trained teachers, and in fact, on the surface, everything looks better in the public sector. And the issue is very straightforward, which is in the public sector, um, their teachers, they believe that teachers, it's all about teaching quality, it's relative teaching quality. Uh, so it's all about people. They believe that we would get good quality teachers by selecting better trained, and paying them more. That's what they've done. So their view of the world is selection is the right way to solve the problem. The private sector does something very different. The private sector selects teachers who are poorly trained, less educated, are paid a fourth of what they're paid in the private sec uh, in the public sector, but it rewards performance. It's what Atif said. It says, I'm gonna test who's a good teacher simply by saying who's a good teacher, not looking at some attributes of good teachers. I'm just gonna look at performance and I'm gonna reward performance. Now, I can tell you models in which both of these views of the world are correct, uh, but the question is empirically, which one is relevant in your context? Education has told us the private sector view of how to produce better education happened to be the right view. My problem in Pakistan is we have views of how Pakistan would grow. What was our view when we first started? Our view was a geopolitical view. We will be central in some global game of risk where Pakistan will befriend the US and we will get Ford to set up its plants in Pakistan and great things will happen. And in the Cold War, we'll be an ally of the winning side. We played a massive geopolitical game. We still play that geopolitical game. Our view of the world was Pakistan will grow by winning the geopolitical game. That's a view. I wanna discount that view. That view could have been right. The data tells us it's not. No one cares about this geopolitical game. We're not relevant in the geopolitical game anyways, because the geopolitical game was really a geoeconomic game, which is, are you producing, do you have people who can buy from the world? And do you have people who can sell products to the world? India can say that, Pakistan can no longer say that, right? So, so we confuse the real game. Um, and I think that's a fundamental problem. Second is what Atif said, we look for messiahs all the time. I have I love Iqbal and Jinnah, but come on, uh, Iqbal and Jinnah did not create Pakistan single-handedly. You disrespect them and you disrespect the thousands of Pakistanis who made those movements happen, right? And we keep waiting for the Messiah. Every time, a, this is Atif's point as well, every time a new leader comes up, whether it's Imran or the Sharifs or the Zardaris or the military, we have this Messiah complex. <laughs> And if you wait for these people to come in and save you, nothing happens, right? And that's our problem, right? We keep waiting for these saviors to come in. And I think Atif and I are there, we completely agree, right? And we should throw out people who aren't delivering. Atif is saying, here's the criteria for success. That's exactly right. Look at politics of Pakistan. Let me say the last thing. There's also an obsession we have. Your questions, Tariq, allude to that. Devaluation. I don't care about devaluation at some level. I don't care about GDP per capita at some level. I don't care about balance of government. I do and I don't, let me explain why. I do in the same way that when a patient shows up to an emergency room and you say, what's your blood pressure? Are you bleeding? Of course you're gonna check. But if all you ever treat is lower the blood pressure and not look at the deeper diagnostic, you never treated the patient. The patient will keep coming back to the emergency room. 
We had an obsession with what I would call boardroom talk or big, big room talk. Okay, badi badi baaten kar le, uh, exchange rate ki baaten kar le, IMF ki baaten kar le, or jo asal baat hai, which is the micro of Pakistan, which is investing in our people, wo phir side room conversation hai. Wo chhoto logon ki conversation hai, bade logon ki conversation kuch aur hai. I'm sick and tired of that approach of Pakistan, right? So, so I, I also push back a bit on how you question about how we should think of Pakistan. I think we should look at indicators which are very different. Cost of doing business indicators. You know, we should, we should be saying, how much does it take for someone to get a loan from a bank? How difficult is that process? That's an indicator I care about. Am I getting good quality or access to education? That's an indicator I care about. Am I getting access to healthcare? Those are indicators in news. Those are not fixable things for me, right? So I think there is a bit of a mindset issue on these things as well. Let me stop. No, I think this is a great conversation and I truly appreciate the openness and the I think this is a great conversation and I truly appreciate the openness and the boldness. Um, let's move on to the way out session. And before we do that, one important point that I'd like to make is, um, you know, without having a deeper conversation on the political environment, um, our challenges are very unique and different as well. You know, we are all in faculty business of academics. We give out multiple choice question. And one of the answers is none of the above. When people go to the election, the choices that they are given, there is no none of the above as it, it is in India. Um, so we have very limited choices available, but I do agree um, that, you know, how do we have built a country where 2% people live in heaven and 98% people live in hell? And a common Pakistani really needs, you know, they don't have the basic necessities of life. So let's say if uh, both of you are given that job of uh, being the economy czar, um, what are some of the things that you would recommend um, you know, fixing it now. We're talking about bringing this Pakistan out of it. So you, you guys are definitely hope for the country with your background and in intelligence. Uh, what is your recommendation? Let's say if you're able to make that recommendation in front of a 800 pound gorilla that's sitting in a Pakistan uh, stakeholder boardroom, how would you, uh, what are your recommendations? Um, Atif, I'll start with you and then Asim. Uh, you always get more time to think about it. <laughs> well, if you can make someone like me the finance minister, I would say the job is half done already. So um, if you, if, 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 so, I mean, you know, you want to talk, you want to talk reality? Let's talk reality then, right? Let's stop beating around the bush. I mean, what kind of a joke is it that you're saying, K, imagine you're the finance minister. I mean, I can never be a finance minister. So um, the question is, what are you going to do about it? Let me pose this question back at you, the audience that is, not individually, Tariq. Um, so that's the reality of Pakistan. No, I cannot be a finance minister. So what do you mean, uh, answer this question? Let me ask you, why can I not be the finance minister? What answer do you have to that question? So. Um, I mean, we, we need to understand what reality is and then approach it. But let me answer your question anyways. I mean, um, you, you can be behind the finance minister. Atif. Yeah. Yeah. But things don't work that way. That, that never works by the way, but in any, in, in any, in, in any event, I mean, I think there is, let's, discuss politics and, uh, as Asim talked about, you know, endogenously, where do leaders come about. There is very uh, nice work by Ali Chima, a political scientist in Pakistan. And, and Sarah Khan, I would add. And Sarah Khan. And, and, and what that work shows is that, you know, if you create more local uh, competition through, let's say, local body elections, that really helps because that's where it allows people, the entrepreneurship of politics is, I cannot just start running for prime minister. I need to first run for the local councillor and then grow from there. What has systematically happened in Pakistan is that that local level of political competition, which will generate the future political leaders from the ground up, we have killed that competition by design. Obviously, there is political economy itself of why that has happened. The army doesn't want it, but the political parties also don't want it, right? So I would say that's an incredibly important reform. And, and like, I, I, I think I'm going to tag on that and then you continue. Uh, there's a brilliant work by uh, Saad Gulzar and Yasir Khan. Pakistanis, um, they just presented this. Um, they did this amazing work in KPK on getting um, more pro-social people elected in local politics, exactly what Atif said, right? So do this experiment where simply by encouraging people who are more socially motivated to run for office, it's an experiment. This is the most scientific thing you can do. They encourage people to run who are more social. They get them to run. They get them to be more likely to be elected. 
not only does, are they more likely to get elected to local bodies, they end up being more likely to chair the local bodies. And now several years afterwards, they've gone back in those same communities and they saw, okay, are those leaders making different decisions? And the answer is yes. They're making decisions which are more in line with what their constituents want. So it's not this is doable. We've done it in Pakistan, right? We have a project, we have such great results from this local election stuff, and yet no one is willing to listen to this. Instead, various Islamabad think tanks, no offense to the think tanks, apologize, I'm part of one in different ways. We don't take the actual data which shows stuff can work in Pakistan exactly along the lines of what Atif just said. Amarabas evidence every is kam. Atif, sorry, continue. So, so just again, I mean, I think it's just super important to have uh, local elections um, before we have provincial or federal elections, something nobody is talking about. Um, the other one, well, and uh, these are just examples, by the way, I don't, I'm not even prioritizing things, uh, but another example, and again, I've talked about this is simple land tax. In fact, the other thing that you can do with the land tax is you can structure it in a way, one other big problem that Pakistan has is a lack of investment, particularly public investment. And I would propose a simple mechanism where you legislate that have particular that have you know given fraction of revenue that is generated from land tax will be used to develop urban infrastructure. So uh, that's implicitly how China developed its uh, urban cities. It's a longer conversation, but that's uh, sort of indirectly that's exactly what they did through land sales. Um, but that's that's another uh, sort of a very basic idea that can have far-reaching effects and also. Not only does it raise revenue and for, for investment, the other thing that it does is it rebalances the incentives away from unproductive sectors and towards the kind of sectors that you were talking about, tradable agriculture, manufacturing, and so on. And is there um, be, again, Adam, I'm going to keep jumping because I think this is yeah. more fun. We can construct together. Atif, what Atif is saying is spot on. And then the question then becomes, how do you politically get this through? Right? Previous government tried land tax. It's a little bit of a but how about the reforms, the land reforms? We haven't done those reforms. Yeah, but, but what they're saying is very interesting. He says, make it incentive compatible. There's a, there's a term we use in economics, in political, in political science and political economy, which is you make reform incentive compatible, which means you, not, you need to find champions who will win from this reform, right? So you need to find people who, will, who are powerful people. I mean, you can, do, you can do champions in two ways. You can take mass politics champions, tire jalaye or or you can take specific individuals who are powerful already, who have a vested interest in getting this land reform through because they will financially benefit from it. Sometimes this is called a Kosian bargain in economics as well, or political economy. You have to write that Kosian bargain. You know, Atif and I spent some time looking at stock market manipulation a long time back. Um, you know, we, we studied how brokers manipulate the stock market. And we estimated, Atif, if I remember, we estimated that the brokerage commissions through corruption or manipulating the market were like $2 million a year or something. This is in the early uh, 2000s. And we were saying, look, if you let the market grow, you can probably have these brokers earn much more money from actual commissions. And the question is, who is willing to write that bargain with these brokers? And I won't mention their names because some of them may be in your audience and some of them may be related to people in your audience, but you know who they are. If you could go to them and say, yeah, market manipulation, chodo, ye hundi shundi ka chakkar chodo. Um, let the market grow, do new IPO listings, and you will make more money, and we will guarantee you will make more money. Same with agriculture. Can you write a cozy and bargain for the big landlords to say you can make more money by having productive land versus having a bunch of mazaras who are unproductive and unhealthy, whose only value to you is that they vote for you? Can you convert them to economic assets for you so you invest in them instead of in interior Pakistan, instead of blocking schools and health centers from coming up, you bring health centers and school coming up because you want a more productive workforce, you want a more knowledgeable workforce, you bring in technology and innovation, you do the latest root irrigation, you need the latest ag tech, you get every farm to be a JGW farm, Jangeet Tareen Saab is one of the most phenomenal industrialists uh, in Pakistan, you get Pakistan to be uh, to create the Monsantos of the world in Pakistan, right? But again, it requires what Atif is saying. It requires these reforms, but it requires us to think carefully about incentivizing the right actors. We don't think of that. I'm going to reform, got to reform, got to, but we don't realize okay, who is going to back this. So Asim, um, and, and uh, in five minutes, we'll be going to the audience for Q&A. Uh, and Noshin, please uh, be on the monitor. So put your questions as brief as possible. We want more time for our speakers. Um, Asim, I want to come back to a question you talked about incentivizing. One of the biggest challenges that we have is the army of non-filers, tax filers, right? 
how do you incentivize people to really come into that where, where we really feel more engaged, involved, and, and incentivized to file taxes? It's something uh, Adnan, uh, Adnan Khan, who is now the chief economist of FCDO, another unbelievable talent in Pakistan, who Azatif would remind us has has left Pakistan. Uh, I mean, he still is engaged, but he's now the chief economist of Pakistan. He was a rising bureaucrat and, you know, is now running some of the largest development agencies in the world and doing a phenomenal job at it. Um, he and myself, Ben Oaken, have been working for the last few years and trying to look at tax reform. Look, it's about incentives. Uh, we've done projects where if you, same thing, if you if you take tax collectors and you reward them for performance, what is your tax collector chore, that tax collector can start performing. If you give citizens value for what they're what they're paying for, you know, citizens are rightfully asking, you know, I do, I pay this money, where does it get spent? You know, Atav you know, local government is a lot of powerful. It's not just powerful because it works, it's powerful because you reestablish your connection with the state. America, people are obsessed with local government. We global politics, where North America is. Forget other countries. Right. And the reason is because they're obsessed with whether trash is removed from their street, whether schools are good in their street. They're obsessed with the local. This reminds me, um, um, Chicago, ka, you know, famously, the mayor was booted out because it snowed heavily and there were delays in removing snow from the road. You so know, from that day onwards, I've lived in Chicago for eight years. Snow is one thing. Kabiri. You know. As soon as it stops snowing, you see the plows out on the streets because the mayor knows, you know, they, they, the, the, the people uh, will not let him live if he if he doesn't do that. So that's the power of local politics. It's the yeah. small thing that touches people's lives that they first want to get done. Before we get to bigger things, you know, we are sort of Artugals and so on. We are fighting those battles. Why ghar ki nali to pehle theek karwa lo? Yeah, I mean, I hundred percent agree. If you look in, in many ways, Pakistan's recipe to success, it's funny. It's like focus on the mundane, focus on the simple, focus on the basic. Because do we have chase? Kerte, when we talk global, we lose our agency. Because it's very easy to then say, "Yeah, but Pakistan's problem is that Afghanistan is war, or yeah, India is doing it, or Israel is doing it, or America has done it, or China has done it." When we say the global game, none of us, even the leaders, have any agency in the global game. But if you say the local game, now you can't blame anyone but yourself. If you have a bad idea in who are you going to blame? You're part of that. You put the first idea in the trash can. You put the first idea in the dumpster. You put the first idea in the trash can. Then you put it in the trash can. Who put it in the trash can? Someone should come up and say, God, you put the first idea in the trash can. Please put the first idea in the trash can. This is the trash can. You put the first idea in the trash can. You put the first idea in the trash can. You know, that's what builds civic value. That's what Atif and I are talking about, and that's doable. No one can prevent you from doing that. You know what I mean? Like, this is what you So let's not talk about these things which we can't address. Let's talk about things which we can address in our domains. Each one of us has a domain of action. Let's use that domain of action. Focus on local government. Uh, Nausheen, um, we'll take alternate terms uh, while you must have read questions. So why don't you please ask the first question? And sure. in the interest of time, we have about 20 so minutes left in our uh, webinar. Um, so maybe you can ask one and I'll ask the other person the other questions. Sure. So an anonymous um, attendee has asked, what is an action that I can take today to support Pakistan, to help it get out of this economic Stop being anonymous. <laughs> Sorry, no offense, but come on. Tell us who you are and what you can do, and then we can comment on it. Anonymous, who am I? What do I do for Pakistan? You are anonymous. Sorry. I okay, but let's address the question. Let's not dodge the question and says, you know, what can, and especially Pakistani Americans and at open platform, you know, there are some really big hitters. Pakistani seem to do and very well and be successful in every country except Pakistan. So what, what is the recommendation for them? Well, I think, well, say one thing, which is uh, recognize your agency for collective action. I think what Pakistan, mm -hmm. baki investment khudi aajayegi, you know, the tech companies, you don't have to convince people to go to India or Israel to, you know, they because, you know, it's, 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 the, the attraction is naturally there or Vietnam for that matter. I think what we are missing and what we desperately need, this is what we started off with. We need ways of collective action. And, and that's why I came to open. One reason was because obviously it's a collection 
mm-hmm. of very smart individuals who are engaged in collective action. I think we need more of that, but also geared towards bringing about change of the sort that Pakistan needs when it comes to collective decision making. The core issue in Pakistan is that the system, the environment is fundamentally broken. It is that that we need to fix. The private sector will come on its own. I don't need to tell people who who, who needs to come and who doesn't need to come. They can make those decisions very well. Our problem is we need to fix the collective decision making. And for that, we need to do coordination, build coalitions. Okay, so uh, Asim, based on your yeah. toughness, um, the anonymous has come out of the closet and he said that- No, no it's not about the name. I mean it that way. But, yeah. but what I was, mean is- He was not able to type his name, it was Fran. So he said that I didn't mean to- Bichara Fran, Fran, I apologize publicly. Um, my point is not that. My point is, look, I have a deep belief. I, I spent 20 years studying education, right, in Pakistan. I'm, I'm super energized. The happiest conversations I have in Pakistan are not with the corridors of power. Those are depressing as Atif knows. My happiest conversations are when I go to small, poor villages and I see people who have very little, who do two things, who give, they give to me. I have a lot, they have very little, they still give to me, unbelievable. And second, they have amazing hope. Their dreams are just big as my dreams. That's amazing, right? And the reason I mentioned that is, what I'm trying to say is no matter who you are, my request is two things, very simple things. One, recognize the amanat you have. I call it amanat. You didn't earn it. Mm-hmm. It was God-given. Someone gave you something. Kayun ko paas hai, kayun ko paas intelligence hai, kayun ko paas agency hai, kayun ko paas sirf muskurane ki salayat hai. Whatever you have, right? You have a beautiful asset. Recognize what that asset is, number one. A lot of us don't. We never see our assets. Second, deploy it. Use it. And use that asset in whatever way is viable for your context in a way that goes beyond yourself. If our maqsad in life is just to apna peet paalna hai, wo kaafi saare log paal lete hai. Let's dream a bit bigger and try kisi aur ka bhi peet paalna hai. Right? And so think about deploying that asset to benefit someone else. That someone else could be two people. It could be two million people. It depends where you are and where you're sitting. Just that way of thinking. And Atar ki baat sahi hai, jab ab collective action kate, wo kaise aata hai? Collective action comes when individuals start thinking like this consciously and talking to each other like this and coming together because they share different passions. How did ED start ED? You know, who in the world would say, I'm going to wake up one day and my thing in life is going to be that I'm going to You just think about it at some level, right? I'm going to be from that initial impetus, this person becomes one of the most remarkable social entrepreneurs in our country, right? So that's, Asim, the, that's the intent. And so I think each one of us can do that. And that's why, Farhan, to your point, I don't know what your background is. It was less about your name. Think about your background. Think about your, your talent and see how you can deploy it. That's it. So Atif, next question, while Noshin will find the other question. Junaid Qureshi, who's also up at our Open Silicon Valley president, he say, is the Pakistani public sufficiently educated and knowledgeable to elect the right local representative? That's one of the biggest challenge that we have. Um, what's your take on that? Yes, absolutely. I mean, let me just be very clear. I think it is a very important, it's a, it's a fundamental premise of politics. You don't need to be educated in any literate sense to know what's good for you. I mean, it's a very fundamental, otherwise you'll go in very dangerous areas if you don't believe in principle. So let me be, so, so this is, in fact, this is exactly what I mean that we need to go back to the fundamental rights of human beings as a Pakistani citizen, which have been snatched away from them one after another. A society and indeed an economy, we talk with Asim was just talking about cozy and bargaining. Well, the, the, the premise of cozy and bargaining is that you give people their fundamental rights. If you expect the private sector to develop in Pakistan, it starts with the foundation of private rights. I mean, even China had to go in that direction to grow. Everything was a collective. So the gradient was in the direction of more private rights. Yes, they are not, they have many problems, but I just want to and, and, and so we have to give people more agency, not less. This is why we just talked about taking elections to the local level. 
So the individual citizen becomes more empowered. They absolutely are educated to know what is good for them, which is the only thing that matters. Let me say one other thing against the so-called educated people. I can give you examples in Pakistan of the most educated people. Just take members of our National Assembly. What kind of decisions are they making? Do you see what they are doing? What kind of bills they are passing? I can give you examples of lawyers association who make the most fascist of statements against minorities. Who, get, who say the most hateful of things. They have degrees. They, have, they are the ones who can sort of uh, practice law. And this is their state of affairs in Pakistan. So perhaps we should you know, put down the so-called educated citizens of Pakistan and empower, empower the common person by giving them political rights at the local level. That will be a lot more powerful. You know, to, to Atif's case in point, this is very real, by the way. This is not just, you know, we talk about talim and tarbiyat, ki baat karte hai, right? In our, in our culture, there's a different notion of talim and tarbiyat. I remember this conversation with an, exactly what Atif said, illiterate labor. I'm sitting in a village talking about how to improve their local school. And this illiterate labor says the smartest things to me. I'm sitting there listening to him and I'm learning from this person. And I say to him, yeah, you're such a thoughtful person. How come up up ne school ke teacher or head teacher ko ye nahi kare? How come you aren't going and telling them these things? He says, Main anpar hun. Literally, this is his words. Main anpar hun. Meri koi nahi That's what he said. And I had nothing to say to that, right? Atif is exactly right. Right. Um, we are all thinking human beings. We should give everyone the dignity and respect to express their ideas and not, not filter people out by what ostensibly you look. Okay. Um, there's a question from Mashud Alam. Can Pakistan learn from Germany and Japan who drastically changed their approach post-World War II, reduced their military size, and got their adversaries help in economic and human development? I'm getting triggered on this, Atif, so why don't you respond? <laughs> um, I've learned a new word, getting triggered. Yeah. <laughs> Well, forget, you know, I mean, Germany, Germany, Germany and Japan are like different. Forget that. We need to get there first. I mean, Germany and Japan were very different societies. They were already advanced. They just lost a war. It's much easier for a, for, for, for a society because their, their human capital was still there. So that's why I'm saying that. I'm just saying, you know, that's just sort of, that's not a very useful analogy for Pakistan. They're very different. Uh, but maybe we can talk about South Korea in the 60s because they were like Pakistan. Um, and by the way, they the general park, so they did have a strong military individual. And it, but these things are not important. It's not that I'm saying that I'm saying let's not overemphasize. Military ko badal do. Let me just say very openly, military in Pakistan is a huge problem. But let's try to identify exactly what it is. For example. The military generals have recently been on the record saying that they have been interfering in the political process. press conference, right? It is that that is terrible for the country. Not only do they interfere, but for what purpose do they interfere? You know, we, we that's the important thing. Number one, number two. Um, what kind of, let's think of incentives we want to give to public servants. A general is a public servant, just like a bureaucrat is a public servant, just like a judge is a public servant, just like a school teacher is a public servant. Servant, yes, are government employees, right? We need to be open and transparent about what incentives are, is the state or taxpayer money giving them. So it needs to be very transparent how much quote unquote benefits they are getting when they become generals or judges or teachers or professors. From a social perspective, I would argue, you can give as much as you want to a general, but from a social perspective, I would argue that no matter how many millions of rupees or dollars you say a general deserves, I would argue that a professor, the caliber of, you know, a tenured professor at Harvard, like Asim Khwaja, 
should at least get the same amount of money. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm saying that is not because I like Asim, but the reason I'm saying that is because Asim is going to educate the future generation of workers and he's going to make them more productive. I'm, I'm not saying the generals don't do that. They might be doing something to, good to defend the country. But I'm saying at least unko at par to place corona. And when you start making, those are judgment calls we are making as a society where the kind of benefits we are giving to one kind of government servants, we are not giving to others like the professors in this case, the teachers in this case, who are actually more influential in expanding productivity in the economy. It's a very economic question. So I'm not, for me, I, I'm, I'm trying to move away from the politicization of this question. And I'm saying to say, let's think rationally about it. Put this on the table, ask a question like this. I am against generals and I'm against army and I'm against, because this is not just a joke. Vote ko izzat do, aaj kahan izzat de rahe hai vote ko? Wo riyaste mudina kya karti rahi hai? So we, have, we need to move away from that. And ask genuine real questions and say, okay, this is a design problem. How do we fix the design? We have the incentives in the public sector completely absurd that the individual who really matters, and again, I'll go back to the teacher, higher education is a big problem in Pakistan. It's not working. We are producing masters and bachelors who are not employable. To fix that, we really need to bring in really high quality human capital and put it inside our colleges and universities to teach the next generation. That's going to require resources. So yes, some of those resources will have to move from other areas of public sector towards higher education. So, so a lot of these things, uh, um, uh, have to be done for the country to move forward. No, that's a great, and we have uh, last seven minutes left. So I'll ask one question and then Noshin will ask, ask the last question and we have to finish in the next seven minutes. Uh, this question is from uh, Asmat Tanoli and maybe Asim, you can address this. What are what is structural issues do you feel could create the biggest impact for Pakistan's economic growth? Uh, um, just three, yeah, let me just say, uh, before I answer that, let me just, uh, Sinan, who seems to be an undergrad from Stanford, so I'm acknowledging big deal, Sinan, not easy to get into Stanford, congratulations. Uh, hopefully you'll be giving seminars in a few years rather than us. Um, he asked several questions. One of them I think is kind of related to what Atif said. Atif to admi ko bura bala kya ke Pakistan to fikat ni mehmar jauga. But in a more serious way, what Atif is saying is, look, I have a different view on these things. Every sector in Pakistan, whether it be the army sector or the public sector or the nonprofit sector, has to reimagine itself. I don't think necessarily sectors are deeply malicious. We may disagree about this. People have their own agendas, but we, I don't see a future of the army without Pakistan, right? Kidder Jangel. Right. So so there is a sense in which I'm and maybe I'm naive about this. There's a sense in which we should have serious conversations with these big players in Pakistan and say, how do we make things work? in a way that we can thrive and prosper. And is there a win-win situation in Pakistan? And I think a lot of times it's very easy for us. I mean, I see talk shows, you know, I've stopped seeing talk shows in Pakistan because they're so unpleasant, right? Atif and I may disagree on, on things, but Atif and I are very close with each other. I have a deep respect for him, right? We, Tariq, you and I may disagree about things, but we don't walk away from that argument saying, right? So there is a sense in which we need to have constructive conversations across power brokers in a way that doesn't make them defensive or threatened, but brings them to the table in a constructive way. And we have to think deeply about that, right? So that's just one thing. And Sinan has raised several questions along those lines. Uh, I think it's doable. Um, do your three structural things, look, for me, it's very simple. Mullah ki dor masjid tak, my masjid ki, my masjid is very simple. Atif already said it, right? It's Focus on education. You just need three things. And honestly, if you do these three things, I don't care about everything else. I, I do, but I really don't. Focus on education, which is our talent. 
In 50 years, Pakistan will be the one place every person in the world will be looking for because they won't have enough young people. Sorry, not even 50 years, 25 years, 20 years. Our population, the problem abhi hai, that will become the biggest asset if we invest in human capital, because every country in the world, including China, has not enough youth. Guess who's going to supply the youth to the world? It's us, right? But it has to be what Atif says, competitive youth. So invest in education, one. Second, invest in not necessarily just healthcare, but health insurance. The biggest determinant or deterrent for someone to acquire human capital and be in a progressive journey in their life is if they get hit with a massive health shock in their family. If your income earner dies, your family trajectory massively derails. I've seen that amongst the rich. I've seen it in friends of mine who've passed away and what's happening to their families and how challenging it is. Imagine if you're a poor person, aapka cushion chala jayega. So have health insurance, health shock prevention in Pakistan. Second, third, uh, create financial inclusion. People who have ideas should be given money as easily as is possible. Don't make them fill in three weeks worth of forms, get a chacha who's rich to show up uh, and get some massive land collateral to offer. Invest in your talent. That's as simple as it gets. That's all I think we need to do structurally in Pakistan if we begin to do that. And honestly, like Atif and I, you mentioned we're part of SERP, the Center for Economic Research in Pakistan, just a plug for SERP. Okay. The reason we're both passionate about SERP is not because of SERP as an organization. SERP's very simple mission in life is recognize and build Pakistani talent. In our case, it's in economics. There should be thousands of places like SERP where we recognize and build talent and appreciate talent. You know, the one person, the person I have one of the most respect for in Pakistan is Sayyid Babar Ali. A lot of us respect Sayyid Babar Ali. What's special about Babar Saab is not his philanthropy and everything else. Babar Saab has never not gone to anyone, no matter how low they are. I've seen Babar Saab talk to undergrads. This is Babar Saab. Talk to undergrads and say, please come and help me. What the, the lack of humility, that the, the lack of ego and the humility that takes is remarkable. We should be like that. We should be talent hunters in Pakistan. And any person we see with talent, we should grab and promote. Well, we are almost to the close. Um, I truly want to thank both you, Atif and Asim. This is by far the quickest one hour, 15 minutes of my professional life that I can imagine. Um, you guys are really so gifted and talented. And I think um, you said it very well. Um, I can assure you that I am going to nudge you. I'm going to code you again uh, for an open platform. We have so many different chapters, but I think that the valuable insight that you came up with, um, and I'm going to leave on a positive note that Pakistan uh, has hope. Uh, as as Asim, you made a very strong point that we may have the supply, you know, unlimited supply. Our, our you know, liability will become our asset with with youth, and and the world is an aging population. Um, and one point from uh, Atif that I really, you know, I, that's my practice also professionally that unless we include our women and minorities, uh, we cannot be a conducive environment. Uh, for growth. And that's critical. And I think that's what really has helped Bangladesh. Uh, they are very similar to us in many things, but they, they, have, they have really involved their women and minorities into the workforce. Um, so gentlemen, both of you, thank you. Actually, so with your permission, I want Atif to have one last, I'm going to put him in the spot and say something last positive, the most positive thing that Atif is feeling at the moment. Because I know he's a positive thinker as well. What on game The best news for Pakistan is that its problems are really small. I mean, it, it's, 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 I guess it's depressing how small Pakistan's problems are that have made the situation as bleak as it is. What do I mean by that? The only thing you need is if you just raise Pakistan's export for like $10 per capita, just like a burger and fries, you just give an individual Pakistani the capacity to sell an additional burger and fries to the rest of the world. This macro imbalance is out the window. All the these these are how small you know eight billion two billion three. The the this is how these are how small the problems are. The thing that is needed is just that collective big push to take those few tough decisions, which is what I started off with. This is ye good news be a bad news be this is where we have gotten ourselves to. How bad do you have to behave to push yourself to this situation? Okay, that's dollar being mil per person. And so I think our problems are very much manageable. In that sense, when people say, oh, it'll take 50 years to no, no, it won't. You can get you can remain stuck for 50 years, I agree. But if you really want it, I fundamentally believe 
fundamentally believe that within a span of what is an electoral cycle, which is five years, Pakistan can completely turn around. Yeah, Narsheen, uh, since this has become a manual, and I apologize, uh, you have been quietly <laughs> listening and, and beautifully listening. Hum female emancipation ki baat karte aur aapne kuch kahani. Can I give you the last words to just summarize what you take away from this and any words of wisdom you want to add? I think there should be far more no, I just, women in I these just, panels. And so, please, very, floor is yours. Very interesting discussion. I just wanted to thank you for your time. Uh, I know you guys are busy men, and we hope to welcome you again and continue the discussion. Noshin, can we have a commitment from them in public that this yes. is part one of our discussion that both Atif and Asim will come back to this forum? Yes. Only Indeed. if you have equal number of women sitting with us speaking. There will be more like women, of course. And, and that has been our challenge that, you know, at Open yep. also. Uh, no, there's some phenomenal, look, we, there's some phenomenal uh, women academics. There's some phenomenal women business leaders. Uh, Noshin yep. is sitting here. Uh, I, I think we can manage that. Uh, and so uh, this was a short sight on our part. I apologize to the women in the audience that, uh, but you know, uh, I, I thank you, Tarek, um, and uh, Mark and Noshi. Thank you. Both thank of you have been phenomenal. Thank you so much, everyone, and all the participants. We will share the recording this session. And once again, Atif and Asim, thank you so much for your generous time and feedback and insights that you have really uh, provided us. I think there are some comments which are inappropriate to you. I will let them pass. <laughs> um, um, for the questions, if you want, Noshin, several people said there are questions that they wanted answered. If someone can just share the chat with us afterwards and we can try to respond to some of them between Atif and I. Yeah. Uh, um, I didn't have the chat saved. So I, no, we, we will create a, a separate, uh, se um, you know, probably a survey for this uh, when we share the video recording, because I'm sure there are many people who are not able to log in today, but they would love to hear this conversation. Great. And once again, Noshin, thank you so much for uh, heavy lifting that you've done backstage as well.